My name's Rochelle. I'm one of the support service coordinators for Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand. And um, before I hand over to Dr. Rob Wineco, I just wanted to let everyone know um, that there'll be the opportunity for some questions and answers at the end of Rob's presentation. Um, there is the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, so yeah, feel free to post your questions um, as, um, yeah, throughout the presentation. And we can't guarantee that we'll get through all of them, but we will um, try our hardest. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rob Weincove, who is speaking on uh, COVID-19 vaccinations in the hematology space. Uh, Rob is a hematologist at Wellington Blood and Cancer Centre and a clinical director at the Mulligan Institute of Medical Research. After studying medicine at the University of Cambridge and King's College London, um, he trained in hematology in London and Germany and undertook a PhD in immunology at the University of Otago. Rob's research interests include B cell malignancies immunology and supportive care. So thank you very much, Rob, for um, being here and sharing your expertise with um, us all. So I'll hand over to you now. Thanks very much. And, and uh, thank you all for, for joining and listening. And thanks to LBC for hosting this webinar. So um, I, I, I've had a very able introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I would just say, so I do have an interest in, in particularly malignancies of B cells, but also cancer supportive care. Um, I'm involved in the supportive care group at the Australasian Leukemia Lymphoma Group, which is a, basically a, an umbrella organization for clinical trials, cooperative group trials across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I do have an interest in immunology. What I would say is I'm not a vaccine or a COVID expert, I'm not a virologist um, or a vaccinologist, but I do keep a keen interest. And um, like many of you, um, uh, I have um, family members or friends overseas and have been watching very keenly with what happens with um, COVID and with COVID vaccine rollouts overseas. Um, so I'll just, um, I was gonna give a little bit of a background um, about COVID-19 and, and its risk to uh, some, at least some patients with hematologic malignancies about what we think might be going ahead and how we're gonna live with this virus into the future. Um, what, what we know about um, how we're faring um, in terms of um, uh, what we've discovered so far about how to treat severe COVID disease and vaccinate against it. Some of the vi vaccines that are becoming available uh, and their adverse effects, and also um, uh, the, the choice of vaccine and those which New Zealand has purchased and which um, how at least it may be prioritized. So look, um, COVID-19 um, is the name of the disease technically, and actually a pandemic, a pandemic respiratory virus um, is really not a surprise. I mean, it's been flagged in uh, international risk um, uh, uh, sort of uh, prognoses for a very long time. And it's as one of the key risks to the global economy. And we've really been anticipating a flu or respiratory virus pandemic for a long time. And actually this is the third coronavirus pandemic. There was a one called SARS uh, in, in, in Southern China in uh, um, the early noughties. There was one in, called MERS, maybe in the Middle East, but also in Korea in 2010. And um, these coronaviruses are what we call uh, zoonoses, which means they're infections that come from animals and spread into humans. Uh, so we know that the original SARS came from a certain species of bat via another animal called civets. Um, we know that the MERS, the coronavirus called MERS, uh, Middle East um, Respiratory Syndrome, came from camels and then spread into humans. And uh, this current one comes from bats, possibly via another host. Um, the difference, main difference with um, SARS-CoV-2 is it's much, much more transmissible. So it's much easier to transmit between humans than those past two coronaviruses. It's less um, severe in terms of um, the fatality rates, but it's still severe enough to have a huge impact on individuals, but also on healthcare systems. Um, now, um, you, you've seen lots about this and, and, and this, the situation that um, has arisen in various countries around the world, including uh, places like Europe and the uh, United States. And certainly um, the, the disease, COVID-19, can be severe in anybody. And the most obvious risk factor when you look at large numbers of people is age. So for whatever reason, uh, possibly because uh, they can develop a nice broad immune, immune response very quickly, children seem very protected. So it's quite rare to get severe disease in children. 
Um, but as, as we age, probably our immune system has been exposed to more things. It's, it, its ability to recognize new pathogens probably becomes more limited. And it may be that we have problems with other organs that means we're more prone to getting sick more quickly. And so the, the, the most major risk factor is, is, um, is age. And that was identified as a risk factor early on. And it remains the case. And that's important later um, because that's been a key part of the vaccine prioritization in, in many countries. Um, it does seem to be the case, unfortunately, that some patients with hematologic cancers are at higher risk of getting severe COVID disease. There have been various studies, and those aren't very granular in that we can't really say with any enormous accuracy what the risk is for one particular malignancy or one particular drug. But um, the, 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 it does seem that a, a, a diagnosis of a hematologic malignancy, or at least certain hematologic malignancies, is, is an independent risk factor, so in addition to things like age. And it's quite, I would say that there are some hematologic disorders that probably don't result in a very high increase in risk. So for example, the myeloproliferative disorders um, where people um, aren't requiring intensive therapies, um, low risk myelodysplasia where people aren't yet being treated. Um, it's, it does appear that, uh, for example, chronic myeloid leukemia isn't necessarily an enormous risk factor if it's stable and in chronic phase. Um, but then on the other hand, there are some conditions where we know both from COVID, but also from other virus infections that people can be very prone. For example, shortly after uh, bone marrow transplants, especially allogeneic bone marrow transplants, people who are currently getting very high dose steroids or intensive chemotherapy, and people who are getting um, uh, treatments that particularly knock out uh, a type of um, immune cell called the B cells. And uh, that includes treatments for certain um, B cell lymphomas and, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And so those are quite likely to be risk factors and there are a couple of non-malignant diagnoses like sickle cell disease, which isn't hugely frequent in New Zealand, but does seem to be a risk factor for severe COVID-19. So um, it's, it's, we're very interested and very keen as hematologists to um, learn what we can do to, to protect you and protect our patients. Um, now, unfortunately, it's likely that going forwards, the world's going to have to live with this virus that causes COVID-19 disease. The name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2, which um, uh, is it technically the name of the virus, but most we, uh, the virus often gets referred to as COVID as well. Um, at the moment, we've um, successfully, uh, or largely successfully contained the virus in New Zealand and Australia. And at the moment, it does seem there isn't widespread community spread. Uh, obviously, like you, we're watching the news each day to see what happens. And this has primarily been through um, distancing, um, various types of lockdowns, and of course, through the strict border controls to reduce the, the entry of, of the virus into, this, into these shores. Um, however, even with the measures that New Zealand and Australia have taken, and even with vaccines, which we'll talk about in a moment, it's not likely that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is going to be eradicated. And the reason is that it's just a bit too transmissible to be able to be eradicated. Uh, like the earlier coronaviruses, and also because it can be um, spread and, and, and held by animals. So um, cats, minks, um, even dogs potentially can actually carry this virus. And in fact, for the latest, some of the recent variants, rats and mice can also carry the virus. So other mammals can carry it. And therefore, it's not very likely that in the long term, it's going to be possible to contain this virus and eradicate it completely. Um, now that sounds um, horrendous, but the other way of looking at this is that actually before this virus came about, there were already four coronaviruses that circulate in humans and you'll have all had probably several of these in your lifetimes. So this is, the, this is likely to be now become the fifth endemic coronavirus, which means a coronavirus that spreads throughout the population. And it's in the very long term, it's likely that people might get exposed to it, either directly to the virus or through its proteins from vaccination early in life, like in childhood. They'll develop immunity. And even if the virus changes, people will at least have partial immunity. So it will be much more serious, sorry, much less serious. So in the long run, it's likely to become a virus that, 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 that becomes part of um, how we all live, um, but it won't in that very long run cause as many problems because we'll all have a degree of immunity to it. Now, clearly, when it, um, a, a large number of people all completely naive to the virus get exposed at once, that's not only bad for the individuals, but also it's bad for the healthcare systems. And that's been a, a huge part of the issue in many countries. So um, 
uh, we saw some countries either explicitly or implicitly try to go for herd immunity by letting people in the population get infected with the virus. And obviously that's been a very hazardous approach. I, for one, am really glad I'm not living in a country where we tried to achieve that because, as you might know from my accents and from the introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm British and I'm trained in the UK and uh, uh, quite a few of my friends and some relatives are working in the UK health service. And it's been pretty, pretty dire there. And I think um, even if one day we open our borders and the virus comes here, we'll be in a much better position to be able to deal with it through vaccination, through better treatments, um, and uh, that'll be much, much less disruptive uh, here um, in an, another year or so than it was in many European countries or the US um, it, over the last year. So the good news is that we're actually, even though this is perhaps not as big a topic as the, as the vaccines, we're getting a lot better at uh, treating uh, COVID-19 disease. And uh, that's through uh, experience, but also through some really good big randomized trials, including ones that New Zealand organizations have been involved in. And that's um, through the use of things like steroids and other anti-inflammatory medications. We know that when someone's got severe COVID disease, we have to give anticoagulation to stop them getting blood clots. We're better at using ventilation. Uh, we're better at using plasma to help protect people. And there are also, as you might have heard, as Donald Trump received, there are these antibodies, synthetic antibodies that can help uh, protect the body against severe COVID disease. Um, now, those are not necessarily all available here right now, but that those, those new antibody treatments, as the companies scale up their manufacturing, they'll become more available. And that, for example, might be very important for people whose immune system is very weak, um, who, who pick up COVID-19 in, in, in years to come. But I expect those types of treatments to become much more widely available as um, the manufacturing is scaled up and uh, as the costs will inevitably come down. Um, so to vaccines. So, um, the, good news, the really good news is that COVID-19 does appear to be very susceptible overall to vaccination. And that, you know, six months ago or, or certainly um, a year ago, that was by no means um, a given. And uh, since we haven't had, until now, we haven't had widespread use of vaccines against any coronavirus. Um, so there's been stunning success, particularly with one type of vaccine, and these are called RNA vaccines. And um, what these are is in a funny way, they mimic a virus itself. So a virus isn't like a cell or a bacterium. The virus doesn't have machinery in place to be able to copy itself. It hijacks the, the cell machinery of cells themselves. So viruses get into our cells, they inject their genetic code, and they hijack the cell to make the proteins that the, the virus needs to replicate and make more copies of itself. And um, uh, RNA vaccines are essentially a, a synthetic purely synthetic version of a virus. What they are is they're a little bit of genetic code, which we call RNA, um, which uh, just in, doesn't allow the virus to make copies of itself. It just provides a particular protein on the virus um, that we can make an immune response against to protect us. And then that RNA is packaged inside a little sort of fatty envelope that mimics in a, in, or, or, or effectively mimics to protect that um, as a a virus envelope. So though that component is, is new and RNA vaccines have been in development and trials um, for a whole host of reasons for some years, but this is the first time that we've seen large scale phase three trials of any RNA virus. And I think everybody in the, in the immunology and, and the virus community has been astonished at how successful these RNA vac vaccines have been. And the two RNA vaccines are the one from Pfizer, originally came from a German company called BioNTech, um, and one from a US company called Moderna. And these two vaccines uh, each appear to have 90% plus effectiveness at, at pre preventing COVID disease in people who aren't immune compromised, and at least with the original version of the coronavirus. And I'll talk a bit about mutations of the virus later. The second type of um, vaccine that's come around is something called viral vectors. And um, viral vectors are not in fact viruses. So some of you with blood cancers may have been told that you have to avoid something called live vac vaccines. There's a handful of vaccines where there's a virus that's been altered so, but, it, but it's still live and it's still able to proliferate, such as the shingles vaccine. And there'll be some of you who told you can't have that type of virus. The viral vectors are not quite the same and the viral vectors are not actually able to replicate. So they are safe to give to people with um, hematologic cancers. And the example of these virus viral vector um, vaccines are the Oxford or AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. 
uh, which is given in two doses, and uh, one from um, a company called Janssen. Um, and basically what they do is they've actually taken a virus that uh, doesn't really normally affect humans to any great degree. In the case of the Oxford one, it's actually originally a chimpanzee virus. And they've taken rid of, get, got rid of the machinery of the virus that lets it make more copies of itself completely. So it can't make copies of itself. And they've made the virus deliver that little bit of um, protein from the coronavirus that we can make an immune response against. Um, that's also a relatively new type of vaccine. And these have proven fairly effective probably about 60 to 70% effective against the original strains of um, uh, the coronavirus that's causing problems. And then finally, um, and, and a bit more recently, there's protein-based vaccines. And that's when people say, okay, there's a particular protein on the surface of the virus that causes COVID-19. We know we can protect people against it if you make an immune response against that virus protein. Let's build that protein in the lab. So just the protein plus a few other bits to, to stimulate the immune response and inject that. And that idea of a protein um, vaccine is quite common. Uh, and a number of the vaccines that are in common use today um, uh, such as certain pneumococcal vac vaccines against pneumonia are, are built like that. So the Novavax vaccine is one example of a, of a, of a protein-based virus. So out of those, um, and, and just to be clear, it's very difficult to directly compare the effectiveness of these different vaccines because none of them have been compared in big trials head-to-head -head yet. And every trial enrolls slightly different patient groups operates in different countries, it's operate, they're operated at different times, and they might have different definitions of protection. But overall, the two mRNA vaccines, the ones from Pfizer and Moderna, appear to be 90% plus effective. The Novavax protein-based one appears to be around 90% effective against the original strain. Um, and the viral vector ones, that the AstraZeneca one and the Janssen one, appear to be around 60 to 70% effective. Now, there is a bit of... Um, a uh, problem, but there is a solution to this. And that's that just like any virus that's out there in the community, and there are many out there, um, the virus will change over time. It's a natural selection process. And we have seen the uh, different variants of the coronavirus emerge over time. And some of those variants are a bit less susceptible to vaccination than others. And other of those variants are more transmissible. Um, now, fortunately, um, the vaccines appear to provide at least partial protection against all of these variants so far. And what's more, there's nothing that means those existing vaccines can't be modified so that they provide protection against the new variants. And in fact, all of those companies are now looking at modifying their vaccines to include bits from the new variants of coronavirus to improve the protection against those. What it does mean, though, is that it's quite likely that going forward, um, most of the population, at least, uh, uh, will, will require coronavirus um, vaccine updates or boosters. Uh, we don't know yet how often, every year, every two or three years, we don't know. But it's quite likely that we'll have to have boosters as the virus changes. And that sounds incredibly alarming, but when you uh, look at, we're watching this, this coronavirus extremely closely. There's so much investment and work going into sequencing every, every well, in New Zealand, we sequence every, every, um, uh, cop, every case. Um, and in the UK, they sequence around 10% of cases, for example. So we're spotting these variants as they emerge in a way um, that then ends up in the papers. But of course, the same thing's probably happening for all the other viruses that are out there. They're changing over time. It's just that with uh, the COVID-19 causative virus, we are seeing that in real time and monitoring it very closely. Um, and again, there's no reason to think that the vaccines can't be modified to be um, you know, 90, 95% effective against these variants as well. Um, all of the vaccines can have side effects. Um, so, uh, and those are similar to um, those that can happen with many other um, vaccines. And so typically that might be being a bit sore or having some swelling at the site of the, the um, vaccination injection. Uh, people might get a headache or feel a bit tired or feel fluey or have a fever, uh, sometimes get some achy joints. And those usually happen within the first two days and they resolve within a couple of days. So they're not, for the vast majority of people, in any way serious side effects. Um, serious side effects are much, much rarer. So about one in 10,000 or fewer people might develop some enlarged lymph glands that they notice. And that's obviously relevant to those of you who have lymphoma, but that should just be transient. So the nodes might just get a bit enlarged. And just to re reiterate, an enlarging lymph gland in that setting is actually part of your body developing an immune response to the vaccine in some respects. And there are some guidance out there that can be regarded as a sign that your immune system is responding. 
Um, occasionally there can be other things like a, a facial palsy, which is uh, temporary and much rarer um, are things like uh, severe um, uh, uh, allergic type reactions. And that's, for example, been seen with the Pfizer vaccine. And so for some of these vaccines, there's some guidance of people with a history of severe allergies to avoid certain types of the vaccine. And that does affect some of the recommendations about the, the, where the vaccines are given and what training the people who are administering the vaccines need. I would say that overall though, the safety of all of these vaccines looks excellent. And when you compare that with the risks of getting uh, severe or even just moderately severe COVID-19 disease, that's far outweighed. Uh, the, 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 so that the risk of disease is far, far outweighs the risk of any vaccine, at least in my opinion, I think of everybody really in the healthcare sphere. Um, so what about um, choice of vaccine? So I'll, I'll talk about one, um, issue um, is that when people have a blood cancer, these are malignancies of the immune system effectively, which means that the immune system function is often diminished either because of their neutrophil counts, so their white blood cell counts, or because um, the T cells or the B cells, which are the immune cells that help mediate responses to vaccines, um, are affected either by the disease itself or by treatments that people have received. And what that means is that people with um, with hematologic cancers may, may well respond slightly less well to vaccination. In fact, we know that. We don't know that for COVID vaccines yet, but we do know that for um, certain hematologic malignancies and things like flu vaccines or pneumonia vaccines. So we have to suspect that people with hematologic cancers might, be, might have a less strong immune response to the vaccine. And for this reason, um, you know, a number of colleagues across um, Australia and New Zealand have um, written to both the Australian and New Zealand government asking that patients with blood cancers are prioritized for vaccination and also ideally are given the most effective uh, known vaccines available. Um, so it's the, to get the most effective vaccine that hopefully will mean that even if your immune response is impaired, you, there'll still be enough to protect against severe disease. Um, it may also give improved protection against vaccine uh, virus variants that might be a little bit more resistant to vaccination. Um, so um, we haven't got enough data to say for sure that a certain type of vaccine is, is better than another, but in many respects, uh, for many countries, they'll be looking at the RNA vaccines or the Novavax vaccine um, as an ideal one to give. But on the other hand, it does depend a lot on vaccine availability. And um, some vaccination is almost certainly uh, a lot better than none. Um, uh, I would say again, there's very little um, really good data just yet about vaccine responses in people with blood cancers. I think a few patients in the Pfizer trial, um, about 70 of them had a history of leukemia or lymphoma, um, but they haven't published the specific results of the vaccination among those people. And that number of 76 is very small um, compared to the overall size of the trials, which is often 30,000 or more people. Um, so, so New Zealand has made arrangements. This is just information I know from the public domain. So I'm not involved in New Zealand's vaccine purchasing strategy, but New Zealand made arrangements to buy enough of the Pfizer vaccine uh, for around 750,000 people. And that one's already been provisionally approved by MedSafe and is being going into vaccination at the moment. Um, as I'll talk about in a moment there, in New Zealand, we're prioritizing the border workers and people who are involved in the isolation and quarantine. Uh, as the first point. Um, that does have a slight, that, that vaccine's got a, a disadvantage that it has to be stored at a very cold temperature, but for a country as small as New Zealand, uh, there's nowhere really in New Zealand that's more than um, uh, 10 hours drive or eight hours drive from a large center. So it shouldn't be a major issue with those storage requirements in this country. It would be harder, for example, to manage in the Pacific. Um, New Zealand's bought enough of the Novavax vaccine, which is probably, uh, which is a very highly effective and maybe similarly effective to Janssen, uh, for around five and five million people. Now it's not yet clear when the Nova vaccine, Novavax version will become available. And they've bought doses of two of the viral vector ones, Janssen and the Oxford, Oxford AstraZeneca one um, to cover most of the population. So like a lot of Western countries, New Zealand's made arrangements to buy vaccine doses that cover more than the total population because uh, when they first made those arrangements, they didn't know which, if any, vaccines would prove to be useful at all. And I'm not sure it's clear exactly which will be rolled out after next, after the Pfizer one. Um, one or two questions came through even before uh, this discussion. There was a 
questions about will I get a choice of which vaccine I get? The answer I think is probably not. Um, and certainly it's the case in, in the UK that you don't get a choice of which vaccine you get given an appointment and it's which one's available. And the government um, centrally makes some high level decisions about which vaccines to offer. So I suspect at least at first, or at least until the vaccines are much more widely available, maybe in a, a year or two, um, people probably won't get a direct choice about which one to receive. Um, so what about prioritization? So when can I get vaccinated? And that's a huge question everyone has. And unfortunately, I can't answer that completely at the moment because New Zealand hasn't announced its full vaccine prioritization schedule yet. Um, but I think we can get some clues from what other countries have done. So um, I just to emphasize, so New Zealand is a bit different to other countries because we don't have community spread of COVID-19 disease at the moment. Um, the number one priority in New Zealand is to strengthen the border. So that is to vaccinate airline workers, people who are um, uh, working at managed, managed isolation quarantine facilities, people who are in contact um, with people coming into the country. So the New Zealand priority is to strengthen the border at, at first, at least until high risk groups or even the vast majority of the population have been vaccinated and then the, then the borders might open. Um, we could probably get some clues from what happened in the UK. So in the UK, they the first group they vaccinated were residents of care homes and their carers. And then they moved on to sort of people over 75 and over 80. Um, and then they got to a point which they're at uh, now, in fact, they've just moved beyond that, to vaccinate all over 70 year olds and vaccinate a big group that they call um, clinically extremely vulnerable. And that group that they call clinically extremely vulnerable is people of any age who have a medical condition that puts them at particularly high risk of severe COVID disease. And um, I, I think that's, that, that's the type of group where patients with haematologic um, would fall. So for example, this is from the UK prioritization. And again, the New Zealand prioritization has not yet been released, but I suspect New Zealand will be looking at other countries to model what they do. But that extremely clinically vulnerable uh, group included people getting active chemotherapy, people having, um, people having radical radiotherapy for lung cancer, and people with cancers of the blood or bone marrow, such as leukemia, lymphoma, or myeloma at any stage of treatment. Um, it also included people having targeted cancer treatments that can affect the immune system and also people who've had a bone marrow transplant within the last six months or who are still on immune suppression medicines. So a lot, a lot of you might fall in that group if New Zealand adopts a similar definition. Um, so that would cover a lot of people with hematologic malignancies, not necessarily all, because some of the lower risk conditions uh, might not fall in that group. For that, they have a second um, slightly lower health risk um, classification, which is just underlying health conditions. And that includes a much broader range by people with chronic um, kidney disease or people with diabetes. Um, but just the extremely, extremely vulnerable group, um, I would be hoping that New Zealand will identify some group like that, um, which would include people getting active treatment, especially with blood cancers. And people with blood cancers were, as I say, um, singled out in the New Zealand, uh, sorry, in the UK guidelines for relative prioritization of COVID vaccination. Um, certainly, what I would point out is that the Haematology Society of Australia and New Zealand has written to Andrew Little, who's the uh, Minister of Health, uh, specifically pointing out the high risk among people with blood cancers and asking that this group is prioritised as they have been overseas. And I know that um, uh, similar letters have been written um, to uh, the prioritisation groups in Australia. So um, watch this space closely. I can't tell you yet where... Um, you as individuals will fall in this prioritization list because it might depend on the wording, but I would hope that um, the wording in the UK guidelines might be mirrored here in New Zealand. Um, so general specific issues for cancer patients getting um, COVID-19 vaccines or, or blood cancer patients. Uh, vaccine safety, there's no reason to think that the vaccine safety is worse in patients with blood cancers compared to anybody else. Um, the, the, none of the, um, well, none of the COVID vaccines that are likely to be used in the West are so-called live vaccines that could actually cause disease. There are a couple that have been in development in India and Turkey, but I don't think they're likely to be approved or used in this country. So none of these are live vaccines. So you can have them even if you've been told not to receive live vaccines. Um, vaccine effectiveness, as I said, might be reduced, especially during intensive chemotherapy, during and for three to six months after you've had drugs like rituximab, um, or during um, other B-cell inhibiting treatments or for shortly after bone marrow transplantation. 
In contrast, people who've received chemotherapy in the distant past, so more than one or two years ago, or those who are just taking some of the simpler drugs for, um, like hydroxycarbamide um, for, for um, central thrombocythemia, probably have near normal immune responses and are probably not at enormously high risk of, of responding poorly to the vaccine. Um, even those of you who are taking, say, one of those drugs that knocks your immune system, like um, steroids or um, ibrutinib or, or venetoclax, it's still worth getting vaccinated, uh, in my view, because partial protection is a lot better than none. And just to say that I talked about some vaccine protection rates, you know, 60, 70, 90 percent. Those are overall protection rates. They, th those rates can be even higher. They can, these vaccines can be even better at preventing the most severe manifestations that lead to people being on intensive care units. So some protection is better than none. We are um, thinking, uh, based on some guidance from other countries, um, about uh, timing of vaccination. So um, look, if, if people were just on the cusp of being about to start a chemotherapy and the vaccine is just being rolled out and that person's treatment can be very safely delayed by a few weeks, there may be situations in which we might just try and get a dose of vaccine in before a chemotherapy. But it's really important and all the guidance from the US and Europe and the UK is very, very clear on this, that if someone needs necessary treatment, if you've got an aggressive lymphoma that's coming back, you must, you, you know, the treatment must not be delayed to wait for vaccination. Um, there may be a little bit of leeway in the more slowly changing conditions like CLL or, um, uh, or occasion or very sort of low grade lymphomas that have been grumbling along for years. But for most people, if you need treatment, you should get on and have your treatment, get the vaccine. You can always have boosters later, whatever, depending on what happens in the future. There is one other thing, which is um, these vaccines are usually given by an inje injection into the muscle. And some of you may be aware that sometimes when you inject vaccines into the muscle, you can get a big bruise inside the muscle called the hematoma. And some of you might run low platelet counts, either because of your treatment or because of the bone marrow disorder you have. Um, to be honest, um, the, 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 the risk of a hematoma is probably a lot less of a problem than the risk of getting severe COVID disease. So the guidance generally, for example, the Australasian Leukemia Lymphoma Group has said that um, to go ahead if the plate, as long as the platelet counts at least 30 and as long as the INR is less than three if somebody's on warfarin and just to press firmly on the area after vaccination. Um, for those of you who've got very low platelet counts, it might be a matter of speaking to a clinician. It might be best just to get the vaccine anyway. Um, occasionally, people sometimes advise to give a vaccine as an injection beneath the skin instead of into a muscle, which can have a lower bleeding risk. But um, that would probably be only for those that really need to have that just because um, we don't know, it's possible it might be less effective under the skin. We don't have enough data to say that yet. Um, uh, some of the guidance says to defer vaccination for three months after bone marrow transplantation, which is in keeping with other vaccines that we give, like pneumonia vaccines, we wait for three months. Um, that we'd have to judge at the time. So, um, I mean, certainly if there's no community transmission, it's probably best to wait a few months after a bone marrow transplant, let the immune system recover a bit and vaccinate then. If we had community transmission, we may decide it's best to just get on and give, back, give the vaccine anyway. We'd have to play that by ear. Um, so the future, I think, is, um, uh, is Rosie, just in many respects, just because this new type of vaccine called the RNA vaccine, one of the things about this type of vaccine is um, technically for its components, it's actually very simple. Um, you've just got the genetic code you want to vaccinate against and a, um, a, a sort of fatty envelope as a packaging component. And to, so those vaccines like the Pfizer and Moderna ones are gonna be very easy to modify to accommodate new mutations of the coronavirus. So you just have to recode the genetic code and then make the virus. And I think it's quite likely that just as we have for flu, we'll, we'll see the vaccines modified year on year to cover new variants that emerge. Um, and uh, it may well be that, that that's going to be the future. Perhaps it'll be possible to combine coronavirus vaccination with annual flu vaccines, and we'll just have one shot each year to protect against those things. Um, uh, it's been slow rolling out the vaccines, and it will remain slow for much of the rest of this year. But there's a huge global effort to massively scale up manufacturing capacity. And I think that by the time we get late in the year, we will see the ability to make of many of these companies to make billions of doses a year of vaccines. And so we will have, and eventually, perhaps by, by mid-2022, more of a choice of vaccine that we can, and we'll have more data about who responds well and who doesn't respond well to certain vaccines.
Um, travel up for New Zealand, I don't know, but I suspect it's likely to remain heavily restricted for much of the rest of the year. Um, I think the New Zealand government has shown that its intent to try and protect the population as best we can. And so I think they'll be quite cautious about full reopening of the borders. All I know is what's in the public domain. I don't have any inside information on that. Um, it may be that we need vaccine passports in, in order to travel overseas in the future. And um, uh, we'll just have to see what happens with um, the vaccines that are offered and, and the safety of travel in the future. I, I, I dearly love to travel to see my family um, in the UK. I genuinely don't know when that's gonna be able to happen. Um, so I think I've sort of said quite a lot of most of what I think I know. And I think, uh, I hope some of this is interesting to you. Just um, I'll ha before I hand over, I just encourage you again to go into the Q&A section and feel free to ask your questions. There's a couple on there already. And some of you might have some more questions that you want to put forwards. And uh, yeah, I hope that's helpful in some way, Rochelle. Awesome, thanks, um, Rob. Um, yeah, very much for your presentation and um, yeah, going through all the different areas of um, the vaccination and also the COVID-19 itself. And um, we do just have a few questions, um, which the first one, does the vaccination stop you getting the infection or just lessen symptoms? Um, and does the vaccine stop transmission of the virus to other people? Okay, so does it, does it stop? Um... So I think I think likely all of those things actually. Um, so uh, vaccines do two things: they protect the individual, and they provide herd immunity to reduce the number of people in the community that can spread a, a virus. So we know from the early trials that they definitely reduce severe disease and moderate disease and even mild disease with symptoms. What we don't know. Yet we got we got some early indications is what they whether they reduce the ability to spread the virus. The assumption is an effective vaccine will also reduce the ability to spread the virus because when you pick up one of these viruses, um, it comes in. Often, we think it often comes in through the respiratory tract, although it's possible it's also by th by by touch and into the into the gut, and that um, the virus proliferates and increases in number. And there's a point. Um, often just before you develop symptoms and for a few days after you've started to get symptoms where you, you can be shedding large amounts of the virus. It's, it's almost certain that an effective vaccine will reduce the amount of virus that you shed and therefore reduce the transmissibility. I would say that the early trials are looking at vaccine effectiveness at preventing severe disease, so they're not as likely to be able to answer that question, but that's just been looked at now. And I think that there's preliminary evidence that the RNA vaccines reduce transmission. So I think they will reduce transmission. It's just that we'll need to look at, what we'll need to do is look at, I think there's some good data coming out of Israel where they've vaccinated quite a large fraction of the population now where they hopefully are now seeing that even unvaccinated people are getting lower rates of disease just because there's less burden of the virus around about in the community. So I'm sure it will. I, I just don't think that empiric data is there yet. Is that oh, all good? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, one question here. Any measures that we can take to improve the chances of a good immune response to the vaccine? Yeah, so... Um, the answer is probably not a lot. Um, so, from a, just from a purely clinical perspective, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion about whether we should be pausing treatment, you know, cancer treatments to let people be vaccinated and things like that. Generally, felt that that's not the right thing to do, but there is some um, guidance from some hospitals in the UK that we might avoid giving the vaccine actually on a day of chemotherapy and give it prior. And similarly, for people who, for example, are on intermittent steroids, like getting there'd be some people with myeloma getting a pulse of dexamethasone once a week. It makes sense not to give the vaccine um, on the day of, or perhaps immediately after that pulse of steroids. So there might be some things we can do with the timing of the treatment. For you as individuals, I don't think there's a great deal, except I would say that um, there's a lot of emerging evidence that having very low levels of uh, a vitamin called vitamin D, sometimes called the sunshine vitamin, uh, can be linked to an increased risk of, of, of um, reduced responses to vaccines and also an increased risk of some respiratory infections. And for those of you who aren't getting much sunshine and those of you who've had strong chemotherapy uh, in New Zealand should probably be taking good care to wear a high factor sunscreen and protect yourself from sun a little bit. Um, some of you might be very vulnerable to infection and might be spending a lot of time indoors. You might want to give consideration to um, 
taking some straightforward vitamin D replacement. And it, it, it's not high dose. We're talking about um, uh, a thousand units a day, which is a standard tablet that you can buy over the counter at a supermarket um, or at a pharmacy. Um, in fact, um, some countries, the UK recommends all children and adults take vitamin D throughout the winter months. Um, it's, not, it's not a blanket recommendation like that uh, in New Zealand, but uh, it's worth consideration and that may, uh, that may improve your abilities, your immune system's ability to respond to vaccines. Uh, if, if you're vitamin D deficient to start with. I'm not aware of a lot else that you can do. Just one other point is that a lot of people will take things like paracetamol to lower fevers and to reduce aching after a vaccine. That's fine to take it if you have a vaccine and then get those symptoms. But um, there is some data from a good randomized trials uh, for other, other uh, vaccines that if you take regular um, paracetamol, uh, on the day of vaccination that the antibody response to vaccination is lower. It may be that having a little bit of fever is quite important to get a good antibody response. And so that's in some big randomized trials done uh, in the past couple of decades. There's some, there's a, a big trial in children in the Lancet. So I would be suggesting um, if you don't be, yes, you might get side effects like aching or fevers, but don't take paracetamol or another fever lowering medicine just because of that. Take it if you develop those symptoms, but don't take it preventatively, it, because it might actually be that some of those symptoms are a sign that your immune system is actually working and that you need those. I'm not aware of much else that you can do personally. Mm. Cool. Um, another question. Do you think it will be possible in New Zealand for a patient with a hematological malignancy to request testing of their antibody response to the vaccine to know whether they are in fact protected? I don't know. Um, the uh, we don't, we, we're, I'm, I'm an, I'm, at least in my hospital, I'm not able to routinely request um, COVID antibody testing unless it's specifically authorised by our infectious diseases department. So uh, the answer is I suspect not. I would say that there is some move to try and do some studies around that. So um, the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group is looking at perhaps um, doing some studies in patients with blood cancers to try and define the response. There'll be a lot of data coming out about that internationally. Um, so the, the answer is I don't know. And I would just point out that although we measure antibodies as a marker of response, we do so because they're the easiest thing to measure. In fact, um, the response to vaccines is partly antibodies, but also partly T cell um, mediated, which is harder to measure and therefore not done as often. So even if you don't develop an antibody response to a vaccine, you may still have protection because your T cell immunity to the virus may be boosted or enhanced by the vaccination. So I think I, I, the answer is I doubt that would be made routinely available, but I don't know yet. Um, another one, if someone had an allo transplant from a donor who had already received the COVID vaccine, would that give them immunity as soon as they had the transplant? What a good question. Um, I don't know, but there, there are studies trying to look at that. And in fact, people, some people have actually done trials where they vaccinate <clears throat> uh, bone marrow transplant donors before the transplant to try and help the recipient. So the answer is there may be some transfer of, of that immunity, but we wouldn't rely on it. And normally we would still revaccinate three months after transplant as we currently do. So anyone getting an allogeneic transplant will get revaccinated against um, a whole range of childhood pathogens. And I think the same will happen with COVID-19. So there may be some passive transfer. I don't think it would happen immediately. It would take, it would take some, weeks or even months before that that built up but there may be some is the answer just a couple of pediatric questions so are pediatric patients at higher risk of reacting adversely to the vaccine will they be yeah. doing the vaccines in children who also have blood cancers so um there are i believe there are trials going on with some of the vaccines i can't tell you which in children to look at um covid vaccination um so so kids with hematologic cancers like leukemias um, are, th their risk of severe COVID disease seems to be lower than adults with leukemias, but it's much higher than for kids that haven't got a leukemia. Does that make sense? So, so what we're saying is that um, they still are increased risk, but it's not as much as it would be for um, an older adult with that malignancy. Um, yes, um, I think we will see um, some of the vaccines, at least some study data available for kids. I would, I would say that um, 
look, pediatric oncologists are very, very accustomed to giving all sorts of medications and treatments and things to prevent infection that are not yet licensed. And some of you, if you, if there anyone on the line who's got um, children with a blood cancer, you may well have been told, oh, this, this um, chemotherapy isn't specifically licensed in children, but it's still standard care. Um, drug companies, it's not a big market for them, so they often don't bother to try and get their medicines licensed in children. Um, so I, I think what, what, what the pediatric, pediatric oncology field will be doing is they'll be looking at trial data, looking at experience. Uh, the pediatric oncology, uh, pediatric oncology field is very international. They're all in very good uh, contact with each other, and I'm sure they'll make some excellent recommendations. And the other part of that question, I think, related to whether it's worth vaccinating family members. Uh, yes, it may be, and there has been some recommendation, I think, from um, the a European group that for those who can't be vaccinated, that vaccinating family might be helpful. Um, that, but whether that specifically, in fact, that was we wrote to Andrew Little and did talk about vaccinating carers of people with blood cancers as well as a priority group, but how that falls because the, the government will look at all of our indications, but they'll also look at all the other conditions, solid cancers, um, diabetes, kidney failure. They'll be looking at all those things as well. So um, that's the sort of thing that in the long run, yes, we may be doing some of that protective vaccination in the future. I don't know data on it yet. Um, another one, um, this person has CLL and has not had treatment yet. My lymphocytes and white blood count are both low. Would I be able to safely get the vaccination? And she also does worry about the speed at which the vaccination has been put in the system. <clears throat> um, yes, you can get the vaccine. I'm not aware of any haematologic cancer that means you cannot get any of the vaccines that are likely to be rolled out here. Um, you should, uh, people with CLL should avoid live vaccines, but none of the COVID vaccines that are likely to be used in New Zealand are live. So yes, you should be able to receive them safely. I can't tell you about the, I don't, I'm not sure the question relates to the speed of the injection or the speed of which things are being rolled out. The vaccine development has been very, very quick by international, you know, by historical standards. Um, but all of these vaccines that are likely to be used in this country will have gone into, uh, well, be, they would have been treated treating tens of many tens of thousands of people in trials before they come here. So there's a huge amount of data on that. And uh, likely, because New Zealand's in the privileged position of not having community spread, our vaccine rollout has, we've been able to be a, a bit further behind and watch what the experience of the rest of the world is. So we, if, if there are rare side effects, uh, we're likely to notice that from the experience in other countries and be able to have time to modify our vaccine program. Um, before that happens on a large scale here. So I think we're, we're, we're in a very privileged position here in that respect. Um, another one, in the US, some doctors are giving advice around timing of the vaccine and treatment, e.g. to stop dexamethasone for seven days before. Is that something we'll need to talk to our hematologist? Hematologist, <clears throat> you might need to check with your hematologist, um, and we'll hope. I, I expect that some guidance will be put out within New Zealand. Uh, yes, ideally, if you're on weekly dexamethasone, having it um, as far away as possible so, uh, would be sensible. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to withhold treatment and then allow your disease to progress because the disease itself could suppress your response to vaccination. So that might end up being a bit of a personalized decision. And the UK, they've gone for quite a pragmatic approach and actually just recommended not having vaccination on the day of chemotherapy. And that's partly because the UK is trying to roll out the vaccination very rapidly because of the particular crisis that they've been in. And um, that means that they don't always get a choice of what doses of vaccine arrive when. So you don't always get a choice of when your appointment's gonna be. You get offered it at short notice and say, okay, you can come along at this time on this day to this place and get a dose. So I think those constraints will ease up considerably as global vaccine supply increases. And I think in the future, we'll have a lot of leeway and we'll know a lot more about this. Um, I think my, my gut feel, I agree with that sentiment that if you're on weekly dexamethasone, it makes sense to put it somewhere, give the vaccine somewhere in the middle of or maybe a couple of days after a dose so that the last dose is worn off and the next one is not about to go in. But um, you might have to speak to your individual um, clinician about that. But I'd suggest waiting till we know what the rollout plan is and when you're going to be offered a vaccine, because at the moment we just don't know that as clinicians yet. We haven't been told anything that you don't know um, in terms of rollout yet. Cool, thank you. Um, another question, um, as patients we are told to wear a mask when neutropenic, do you think 
we should be more routinely wearing masks until more of the population is COVID vaccinated <clears throat> regardless. So that's a really interesting question, actually. And it is a point that's come up in some of the international guidance, which is that it's possible that patients with blood cancers in those higher risk groups, like people who are getting vaccinated while they're on active chemotherapy or who've uh, very recently had a bone marrow transplant or who have um, who are currently on medicines that, that, that diminish that are known to diminish vaccine responses. For those people, the vaccine response may be diminished, is like, it may well be diminished, or we may expect it to be diminished. And for that reason, uh, people in that group should probably still maintain um, some caution around things like mask wearing, even after being vaccinated, um, and be much more pay much more attention. For now in New Zealand, again, um, there have been sporadic community cases, but to my knowledge, we do not have widespread community spread of this virus. So my advice, at least to my patients, has been to just pay really close attention to what the government recommendations are, and more so than other people around um, uh, lean towards taking extra precautions. So um, I, I don't think there's an absolute need to, to wear a mask everywhere you go if, the, if you're in an area that doesn't have any community spread. Perhaps if you're in the Auckland region, you want, might want to be that bit more cautious and certainly follow whatever the rules are. If the rules are to wear a, a mask on public transport, do so, and then pay, perhaps pay extra attention to your hand hygiene and perhaps try and see if you can get a really, really good mask um, that provides really good protection. That's what I would do if I was in, in, in your position. While there really isn't community spread, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the mask wearing um, uh, adds that much, but particularly if in future our borders open and it does start to come to the community, then take extra care, I, absolutely. Cool. Um, another question, would you stop maintenance therapy for a period to get the vaccine, e.g. if you're on <clears> the <throat> So, so personally, again, I'm going off um, other guidance. I'm not specifically a myeloma treatment, but most of the advice is not to stop maintenance. Um, look, if, if, if more data becomes available, that might change. I would specifically for lenalidomide, it's an interesting drug because it can actually stimulate some parts of the immune response. So it's by no means clear that lenalidomide itself will actually suppress your immune response to, to, severe, uh, to, to, to a vaccine against COVID. So I, I probably wouldn't stop lenalidomide. I probably would, if I was going to do anything that I might emit one dose of dexamethasone around the day, but lenalidomide my probably isn't something that I would pause. Um, yeah. Um, you did mention about the um, enlarged lymph nodes after it. Um, one person's asked, um, I've heard about some of the women having mammograms shortly after being vaccinated and their lymph nodes were up. So wondering mm -hmm. if there's any information um, <clears throat> about lymph nodes in the vaccine. Yeah, so enlarged lymph nodes, just bear in mind that an enlarged lymph node is part of a normal immune response to an infection. And so that's that's a sign of your immune system working. So transient and tr so briefly enlarged and slightly tender swollen lymph nodes is a normal response to an infection and it's a normal response to an effective vaccine. So that's normal as long as it's short lived. Um, actually people, going along to their doctor and complaining about enlarged lymph nodes after vaccines, that was quite rare in the trials done to date. I mean, sort of one in 10,000 or fewer people. Um, but yes, I mean, if, if you just had a vaccine and then someone happened to do a, a CT scan and showed your lymph nodes around where the vaccine was given was slightly enlarged, I guess that could be a risk because someone may think, oh, that might mean you've got lymphoma, whereas actually it was just a transient response to vaccination. So I suppose that's a possibility. I think lymph, enlargement of lymph nodes is so large that you really notice it um, uh, is quite rare. And if you do notice it and it goes back after vaccines and it goes back down again, probably then it, it won't be lymphoma. It will just be a normal response to the vaccine. Um. Another question, if we refuse the vaccination when it's first rolled out, are we able to get it later? Probably is the answer to that. Um, so so um, I don't think that anyone in the healthcare service would be so petty as to say that's it, you're never going to be able to get a vaccine. So I, I think the answer is, I think, probably. Um, I just do, I, what I can't tell you yet, and there's a couple of questions here about how, what priority group you will fall in. I don't know because I haven't seen that announced. So I've, I've, I've said a few things about what's happened in another country, just because I'm familiar with it, having family members and things. And so we've watched that quite carefully. Um, and I suspect what New Zealand does will be in some ways similar, but I don't know exactly. I, and I can't say when um, you as an individual will be getting a vaccine. Um, yeah, probably just time for a few more questions, but um, this person has follicular lymphoma. Um, and had quite a strong reaction to 
this year's flu vaccination, uh, vaccination swelling and body rash. Um, they've been advised by specialists not to have future flu vaccines. Um, yeah, what they, what would they be able to do? Yeah, well, that's tricky. I would, I would be checking with, I'm not sure what specialist that was, and I'll be checking with that specialist. So the, 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 so the first thing is that the COVID vaccines aren't flu vaccines, and there are different constituents, but um, oft, it, often, so, so the, the, the portion that's from flu shouldn't be an issue, but often, um, so all vaccines contain, it's not just the actual vaccine substance, there's also uh, other things called, often called adjuvants, so things to boost the immune response. And there's also, um, in any medicine, there's usually something we call excipients, which is the extra things that are in there to help um, maintain the, the, the stuff stable. So that might be um, chemicals that modify the, the acidity to make sure it's the right state, the right acidity, or things to hold the vaccine in solution so it doesn't all stick down to the bottom of the bottle and doesn't go in. Um, so it, it might depend on exactly what you've got. So I think that's a situation, you've had a severe reaction to a prior vaccine. That's a situation where that really needs specialist, specialized or individualized advice. And um, if, for example, I had a patient in that scenario, I might try and find out what, uh, which flu vaccine they got and what the list of so-called excipients are, so all the other things in the vaccine. And um, I might even try and get advice either from an, a, an allergist or a um, or an infectious diseases physician about the recommendation. So I'm, I'm not sure I can give specific advice to that person. Just because you've reacted to the flu vaccine doesn't necessarily mean you'll react to COVID vaccines because the vaccines are different, but I'm not sure I could say exactly what the risk is at this point. Yeah, there were just a couple of questions on specific um, kind of drugs that people were on. Um, yeah. So if a person's on cyclosporin, is it advised to um, get the vaccination and another one if they were having immunoglobulin? Yeah. So, um, so cyclosporin, um, uh, if, so some of the guidance out there at the moment is if, if somebody's having cyclosporin because they've just had an allogeneic bone marrow transplant in the last three months or so, some of the advice is to defer vaccine until the immunosuppression is weaned off. Um, so, so a lot of people have to bone marrow transplant on cyclosporin for three months and, it'll, and then it'll be weaned off completely. And so it might, if, if it's simply a matter of waiting an extra four weeks till you're off the drug, then giving the vaccine, that might be the best approach there. If it's that you're on long-term cyclosporin and there are some people who'd be on it indefinitely, then it's probably better just to get vaccinated anyway, because you'll still probably develop some immune response. And if you're on cyclosporin long-term, it's probably because you've got say an immune condition that could be at risk if you stopped it again. And I, it, it certainly wouldn't be recommending stopping the drug for vaccination. So in general, I would say, yeah, if, 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 if it's short-term cyclosporin use and due to stop, it might be reasonable to wait until it comes off and vaccinate then. If it's long-term use, just get on and get the vaccine. Well, thank you. Um, we yeah might wrap up now, if that's okay with you, Rob, because I do want to respect your time as well. Um, there are some questions that we didn't get to, so um, or directly get to, but hopefully you'll be able to re-watch this talk um, and kind of get your answers through that. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact with any of the support coordinators through LBC um, and also your healthcare team as well um, for any specific um, questions you might have there. So um, thank you very much, Rob, for um, yeah, spending your time and being able to tease out all those questions and concerns um, everyone's had. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of comments actually that um, it's been very reassuring and a lot of information, but so good that we can also yeah, rewatch it. So thanks again. No, thank you very much. And um, look, we really look forward to seeing what the rollout is. And uh, just to say that the HSA and Z has written to the government on behalf of cancer, you know, blood cancer patients in New Zealand. So we're hoping they'll listen and, 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 and um, that many of you will be prioritised for vaccination. We just look forward to seeing what the final uh, decisions and, and the wording of those criteria are. Uh, so all the best everybody. Right. Well thanks again Rob and thanks everyone for um yeah joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.